him. I wonder how many people view him today. Do they still see him as the Lord God Almighty, high and lifted up? Or they still do they look upon him as a good old boy? Just something that can take or leave. We share with you a thought this morning how to live for God when the heat is turned up. One can't help but pay attention to the news. I've got to where I don't watch a lot of news anymore because I just get tired of hearing it, to be honest with you. But you can't help but pay attention to some of it and, and, and have to can't bury our head in the sand and pretend that things are going to go away. I do believe with all of my heart there is hope for America. But I also believe with all of my heart that hope comes through the instruction and the direction of what the Word of God tells us. That famous verse of Scripture in the Chronicles where he says, If my people, yes. that's the church, yes. who are yes. called by my name, yes. that's us. Yes. We'll get off of our high horse and humble ourselves before God yes. and pray and seek His face. And if there's anything in our life that shouldn't be there, he says to turn from our wicked ways. Yes. To put the things of the world behind us and put him first and foremost. When we do these things, he said, then will I hear from heaven yes. and will I heal this land and I'll hear the prayers that are made in this place. Yes. We live in a very disturbing age. We live in a very disturbing time. And my friend, let me tell you, I pray with all my heart daily for revival in America. I pray with all of my heart daily that, that, that people's hearts will, will, will turn to God and, 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 and allow the Holy Spirit to do a sanctifying work in them. To bring about a life change and a lifestyle change because whether people realize or not, Jesus Christ is their only hope. And Jesus Christ is their only answer. But if it keeps going in the direction that it's going, and in the path that it's going, I will tell you, we're headed down a slippery slope real quick. Yes. And America has been, it's been said, and I, I, it breaks my heart to agree with it, but I agree with it. That if America doesn't fall on their face before God and repent, we will become a third world nation very shortly. We're headed that way. Yes. In a land of prosperity, in a land of plenty, this generation of people today aren't going to be able to deal with what, what, what the old timers used to refer to as hard times. That's right. This generation today that has had everything given to them on a silver platter and everything handed to them in a life of ease, they're not gonna, they don't, they don't, they're not gonna have a clue of how to make it and what to do when hard times come. And rest assured, my friend, there are hard times coming to America if America doesn't repent. I was reading this week uh, once again in the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. And I've read the book of Daniel many times. I've done some studies in the book of, from the book of Daniel. Have always enjoyed uh, reading and preaching and teaching and studying the book of Daniel. Daniel is an Old Testament prophet that he, his writing begins with some history of the Jewish exile from the land of Jerusalem and Judah and in Israel. And when Nebuchadnezzar the king come in and took them to captive 
In verse 1 of Daniel chapter 1, he begins to talk about how the third year of King Jer Jericho, Jericho, king of Judah, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, besieged or he overthrew Jerusalem. And I've read this many times, but as I begin to read this again, the Holy Spirit began to quicken my attention to some things in a way that I had never really seen them before <coughs> that I believe are quite relevant to the time that we live today. Yes. Number one in verse four, one of the first things that Nebuchadnezzar did was try to change the way they thought. He tried to change their thinking. Yes. He tried to change to get them to look at things in a way that he wanted them to see them. From a Babylonian worldview, as we would phrase it today. See things differently. Yes. The second thing I noticed in verse 5 of chapter 1 was he offered them a compromise to their way of living disguised as something better. If you'll notice that I have highlighted here in the, in the overhead where it talks about uh, providing them with a portion of the king's meat. Keep it in mind that the Jewish people were under strict dietary laws ordained of God. Whenever he gave Moses the, the, the Old Testament law, part of the law included their diet, their, their, the, the, the dietary law, as it's referred to. And in that dietary law, there were certain meats that, 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 that God said were clean, which means they were permissible to eat. They were okay to consume them. There were many things that were unclean that God said that man, uh, that he did not want his people eating. Thank God that he cleaned it in the New Testament because there's a lot of things we eat today that under the Old Testament dietary law we couldn't eat. That I happen to like. But under the Old Testament dietary law not only was their, their, their meat were you know, permissible or unpermissible, it was also instruction on how to prepare the meat, how to butcher it. It had to be butchered in a certain way. It had to be processed in a certain manner. And then also it had to be cooked in a certain way. I ain't going to take the time this morning to even comment on the reasons possibly behind that. But that's just the way God ordained it. That's good enough. The king's meat, as it's being referred to here in verse 5, it included meats that the Jews were told not to eat because they were considered unclean. They were prepared, they were butchered, and they were prepared in a way that did not meet up with the Old Testament law. And they were cooked in a way that did not meet the standards of the Old Testament law. And on top of all of that, they were, as they were, were brought together, oftentimes, most of the time, if not every time, the meals, the meats, the, 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 the things that went on the king's table were set before pagan altars. Before pagan gods, in the tent, prayed over them in this manner, believing that the pagan gods would bless the king's meat. Now, having said that, the compromise was he gave them something that they were not supposed to indulge in, 
under the pretense of something better. While the rest of the nation was eating far less than that, and the rest of the nation was doing good to, to, to have food on their table at times and food to eat at times, well, if you'll compromise, if you'll give in, you can have the best. In verse 6 and 7 of chapter 1, he also began to try to change their identity. See, whenever they went into verse 6 tells us, shows us how that whenever they went into the land of Babylon, they had names that, 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 were, that reflected God. The name of, of Daniel and the name of of, of, of Hananiah and Michelle and Azariah, these were names that if you look into them, every one of them pronounced something about God's grace, God's goodness, God's mercy. Yeah. So that every time their name was mentioned, it was a proclamation of the goodness of God. Yes. True. So, Nebuchadnezzar Rather than allow that, he gave them pagan names. He changed Daniel's name to Belshazzar, which was a reflection of the pagan god of Baal. He changed Hananiah's name to Shadrach. Once again, in reference to one of their pagan gods, Michel was called Meshach. And I was called Abednego. And every, every, every time these names were mentioned, it was kind of like a slander. It was kind of like a slap in the face because where at one time they used to give God praise when their name was mentioned, God's grace, God's mercy, God's love, God's, 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 God's faithfulness, every time their name, now they were, every time their name was mentioned, it was praising a pagan God wanting to change their identity. Yes. Then we read a little farther in chapter 3, verse 5. He wanted to change their worship. Nebuchadnezzar erected a statue of himself and a commandment was given that at a certain time and all the people were supposed to gather together all people were supposed to gather together. Yes. And there would be music that would be playing. And at the sound of this music, people were supposed to bow down before the image of Nebuchadnezzar. Well, anybody that's ever read anything about Jewish history knows that that's was forbidden. Yes. Jews have no other God but Jehovah. And they'll worship and they'll bow to no other God but Jehovah. Amen. Still true today. So he tried to change their life to conform into a different way of life so that they would fit in. So that they would blend in. So that they weren't noticeable. So that they that they that they that they, they, they just one of the, another face of the crowd, so to speak. Well, someone might ask the question, well, what has that got to do with today? Can I tell you that the same demonic spirit that drove Nebuchadnezzar of the Old Testament? is the same demonic spirit that's at work today and he's at war with the church of Jesus Christ yeah. and he's doing everything he can today to do the very same thing to the church of Jesus Christ. Can I tell you, he's trying to change the way we think to where we don't think on the things of God any longer. Well, I'm going to tell you, it breaks my heart this morning. It grieves me in my spirit in a way that my vocabulary will not not express this morning how casual and how nonchalant supposedly people that love God treat him and think of him so casually when there was a time where nothing in this world was more important than God. No one in this world was more important than God. But I want to tell you something. 
There has been a change. There has been a push. There has been, and you remember, you remember what I'm saying when I say this, because I remember sharing that little analogy some time back about the frog in the kettle and how if you put a, a frog in a, a pot of boiling water, he'll immediately jump out because he realizes and he's got enough sense to realize that it's dangerous and he'll get out, he'll escape it. But you put that same frog in a kettle of water or a pot of water where he's comfortable, where things are at ease and you can light a fire under there and you can turn, begin to, he turned the heat up and you begin to increase the heat ever so slowly and ever so gradually and that same frog that jumped out of the first pot will set in that second pot until he falls. Yes. Right. That's happening today. Yes. The heat is being turned up. Things are changing. Things are coming against the church. Things are coming against the believer. Yes. But it has been coming so slowly and so gradually and so subtly. It won't change the way we think. Many people say, oh, preacher, you're just crazy. You're just crazy. Hear me when I tell you something today. The Judeo-Christian church in America for the most part, does not honor God and hold God in the, the high regard and the high esteem that we one time did. How do you know that if we did, this building would be packed this morning? Amen. People use every excuse, and I know sometimes there are legitimate reasons why people can't attend church. I know that. But there's a major difference between an excuse and a reason. And we're not here to, for personalities or, or, or we're not here for it. We are here to honor God. Amen. We are here to praise Him. We are to here to lift Him up. Yes. People of like faith and of like mind and of like yes. passion have gathered in this place to praise Him. Yes. Why? Because Not because of what He does. I am so thankful for all that God has done in my life. All that He is doing in my life today and all that He will do in my life tomorrow. I don't have time to talk about all that, but I am so thankful for more than that because He is God yes. and He is worthy to be praised. Yes. Even recently, Hillary Clinton in one of her campaign speeches a couple of years ago made a declaration and made a statement and it made chills run up and down my spine when I heard it. Well, the church is just going to have to rethink some things. The church is going to have to just rethink some things. I want to tell you something, my friend. I will never rethink anything that goes contrary to the word of God. Amen. What God said was yes. right yesterday is right today and it'll be right tomorrow. What God said was wrong yesterday is wrong today and it'll be wrong tomorrow. Yes. That never changes. Yes. There is no debate. There is no discussion. Point settled, period. God said it. Whether I believe it or not, that settles it. Yes. We're going to push today to change the way we think. Secondly, there is a compromising spirit today. Compromising spirit for something better. There is a standard that God has decreed in His Word. It's called a standard of holiness. And without holiness, no man is going to see the Lord. That's what He said. And we as believers are told to pursue holiness. Yes. To go after holiness. To try to attain holiness. I'm not talking about legalism. I'm talking about a life and a lifestyle that reflects the Lord Jesus Christ in all we do. To be his ambassadors. To be his representatives. To be who he is to this world. But there's a push today to compromise. There's a push today to let down the standard. Yes. There's a push today. Well, it's all right. That was, you know, 
Grandma and Grandpa was too hard. But it's okay today. We're young and, you know, we're, 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 and we can have a better way of life. There's a push today. Go ahead and cut a few corners. Go ahead and kind of skirt the truth. Go ahead and do things in secret that you think no one will know. I'm going to tell you something. Nothing we do in secret, God doesn't know. There are no secrets from Him. Yes. It breaks my heart. And I was in a conversation recently with, with an individual and we were talking how sad that it is that many of our government programs today condone an unholy, ungodly lifestyle. They will embrace and pat on the back a standard of living and actually reward a standard of living that goes against the Word of God. Yes. Our government does this. Yes. And it breaks my heart. Under the pretense of a better way of life. Let down the standard. Let down the standard. Give up God. I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> oh my Lord, help me hold the ghost this morning. Because there's a lot of people today that they live and the, 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 the devil will jump on their back and begin to whisper in their ear. Well, go ahead and cheat. Go ahead. You get ahead that way. Go ahead and lie. You get ahead that way. Go ahead and connive. You get ahead. Go ahead and go ahead. And I'm going to tell you something, my friend. The things compromise. You might get by with it for a while in this world. A person who compromises their their standard, God's standard of holiness for, for, for what they deem is a better lifestyle, they might get by with it for just a little while. They may enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, as the word puts it, for a little while. But one day, they're going to stand before God. Amen. And, and they're going to have to give an account. And they're going to have to explain to God why it was more important to do this than what it was to follow Him. The third thing is they're trying to change the identity of the church. Trying to change the identity of the church. What is the identity of the church? Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The identity of the church is Jesus Christ and what He did for us when He saved us, when He redeemed us, when He bought us. Oh, I wish I had time to preach this morning. If we take it for granted and we take it so lightly that he was brutally tortured and beaten to within an inch of his life. He suffered agony. He suffered torment. He suffered shame. He suffered reproach. He suffered un unmentionable, unbearable agony for you and I. Gave his life. They didn't take his life. He gave his life. Not as an execution, but as a sacrifice. Yes. That cross yes. became an altar. Yes. And he was the perpetuation for man's sin. He was the one that, that Adam broke God's covenant back in the garden. But Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary was the one that brought God and man back to a place yes. where we could have a right relationship once again. Yes. He is the identity of the church. Yes. And we as believers yes. are to be His reflection. We are to be His ambassadors. We are to be His examples. We are to be His mentors. We are to be the ones to set the standard for the world to follow. I want to tell you something that grieves my heart. Because the mindset of American Christianity today is live it up. Let's have a good time. 
We don't have to be different from the world. We don't have to act different from the world. We don't have to. We, we can blend in. We've got to blend in with the world if we're gonna if we're gonna change the world. I'm telling you, let me tell you something. That lie from the pits of hell never has worked, and it never will work. We are called out. We are called out from the mindset of the world. We're called out from the filth of the world. We're called out from the trash of the world. We are a city on a hill that cannot be held. Yes. And we are to be the reflection of holiness, the reflection of righteousness, not our own, but the holiness and the reflection yes. of Jesus Christ. We are supposed to be noted. We are supposed to stand out in a crowd, not just by the clothes we have on our back, yes. but the words that come out of our mouth and the actions of our hands and the, our work ethics and, and everything about our life. It's supposed to be a reflection yes. of Jesus Christ. Amen. And they're trying to change our worship. Yes. They're trying to change our worship. During this past year with the COVID pandemic, many churches closed. There were some that tried to remain open and they were penalized. They were they were they were uh, sanctioned. They were they were uh, my wife and I saw one was in Canada recently. We saw on a video where they went in one Sunday morning, they 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 dip, took everybody out of the church and they built a fence around the church. Yes. Yeah, arrested the pastor. Arrested the pastor and built a fence and have guards to keep people out. People tore down. That's how bad things are getting. They're trying to change their worship. Yes. Our state overseer, Brother Claypool, which by the way, he'll be here in October to, on Sunday to, to, to uh, he's excited about coming to to visit and preach for us that Sunday morning. I'll be keeping you abreast of that. But he and I were in a conversation here uh, a few months back, and he was talking one day. He said, you know, he said, I was telling somebody about what you guys are doing there in Redfield, trying to get a church started, trying to get something going for God there in Redfield. And he said, well, are they crazy? Trying to get a church going in the middle of a pandemic? He said, no, they're not crazy. He said, what better time to get a church going? When a, in a time of crisis when people need Jesus Christ. Amen. What better time to get yes. something going? I'm going to tell you something, my friend. We're sitting in the pot and the heat is being turned up. Yes. It's being turned up gradually and it's been turned up subtly. Very, very, very slyly, very cleverly, and the things are being slipped in, and things are being slipped in, and things are being slipped in. I hear headline news reports, and you know, I'm very disturbed about things that I'm hearing. But I'm here to tell you today it's time that we, as the church of Jesus Christ, take a stand for God. We take a stand for God. The day is coming to some degree, and it is here today more than we realize that we're going to have to make a decision whether we take a stand for God or not. Hear me what I tell you. In Daniel chapter 3, that's the, the famous account that we often have read about, about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being thrown into the fiery furnace. I mentioned a while ago how the Nebuchadnezzar the king had erected the image of the statue of himself and he commanded that they worship. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, we're not going to bow. Ain't going to happen. Yes. He called them into kind of a private council, if you would, and said, now fellas, look, I realize you being Jews, you know, you can't do this openly and, and all that. And he said, I understand that. 
I don't want to do this thing. He said, go ahead and bow down in front of me here in private. Nobody will know but just us. But you're going to bow. Or you're going to burn. We look in verse 17 of chapter 3. And they said, we're not going to bow. Because our God is able yes. to deliver us. Yes. We're not going to bow. Verse 18, he said, Be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve your God nor worship your golden image. We're not bowing. We're not giving in. We're not giving up. You can call us by whatever name you want to call us by. Yes. You can you can try to starve us to death if you want to. You can do all these things you want to do. But we're not bowing. We're not giving in. My friend, let me tell you, the day is coming. And it's here today to some degree where we're going to have to have that kind of tenacity. And we're going to have to have that kind of backbone for God where we're going to stand and we're going to look at uh, maybe our boss in the eye or we're going to look at and we're going to have to tell a family member in the eye or we're going to have to look and tell a friend in the eye or we're going to have to tell some uh, uh, official in the eye I'm not bowing down to your God. I'm not bowing in. I have one God. His name is Jehovah yes. and he alone will I worship and he alone will I serve. Right. Ephesians 6 and 11 tells us that we are to stand against the wiles of the devil. We are to take a stand yes. against the enemy. It's time the church of Jesus Christ stood up. We stood for holiness. We stand for righteousness. We stand for godliness. We stand for God. Yes. Time will not allow me this morning. And then in, in Ephesians 6 and 11, we're talking about putting on the armor of God. I wish I had time to preach this morning about putting on the armor of God. That'll come at a different time. But I'm here to tell you the word exhorts us and the word challenges us and the word basically commands us that we need to take a stand for God against the works of the devil. Amen. You say, Pastor, that sounds so easy. It sounds big. It sounds easy. But how am I going to do it? And I'm glad you asked. <coughs> See, today is Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost Sunday is known as the birthday of the church. The church as we know it was established and go, got going on a day much like today. In Old Testament times, the Feast of Pentecost was one of the celebrations that God commanded Israel to observe every year. The New Testament brings this day of Pentecost, this Feast of Pentecost, to a whole new life. In Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 1, it said that when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the place where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them utterance. This event and this occurrence was something that Joel, hundreds of years before, had prophesied would take place. This event was something that Jesus himself, weeks prior to this, spoke that would happen in John's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 20. Six, we read, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, 
whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Luke records in the book of Acts chapter 1 Jesus speaking as he was assembled together with that crowd that day that was there when he ascended back to heaven commanded them they should not depart from Jerusalem in verse 4 but wait for the promise of the Father which said he you heard of me he said in verse 5 for John truly baptized with water but you're going to be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence in verse 8 you asked the question a while ago how am I going to stand how am I going to stand? Here's your answer. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. How can you stand when the heat is up? You can't stand in your own strength. Right. You can't stand yeah. in your own power. You can't yeah. stand by your own attempt, your own talent and your own ability. But my friend, let me tell you, when you've been endued with power from on high, when you have received and accepted that precious gift of the Holy Ghost that God wants to pour out upon you, you can have the power, you can have the authority, you can have the ability to do all things. Yes. From that day to over 2,000 years ago to today, there have been multitudes of millions that have been baptized in the Holy Ghost just as they were in that, in that day of Pentecost, recorded in Acts 2. From that day until now, there have been multitudes of millions who have been given the supernatural endowment of, of power that comes from on high to give them the courage, to give them the strength, to give them the help that they stand, that they need to stand and look at the devil in the eye and say, we're not bowing, we're not giving in, we're not surrendering. I'm standing straight, I'm standing tall for Jesus Christ. Yes. So this is another area where culture is trying to change our identity. Oh, you don't need that. That died out 2,000 years ago or with the, with the early church. Whenever the last apostle died, all that died out wrong. It's just as real today in the 21st century as it was in the first century. Amen. And it's just as much for us today in the 21st century as it was in the 1st century. And we need it as much today in the 21st century as they needed it in the 1st century. Maybe even more. Yes. We need yes. the endowment of power. To be able to do what we have been commissioned to do in these last days. Amen. Because understand what I'm telling you. All people don't go to heaven. That's right. There is a heaven to gain for the righteous eternal life for the righteous eternal life for those who have given their heart and life to Jesus Christ and who are doing their best to live for him there is a, a reward but at the same time under the same measure there is eternal damnation for those who reject and those who refuse Jesus Christ. That's right. 
those who look at his word and say, I'm not doing that. I'm not living that way. I'm going to live the way I want to live. I'm going to enjoy life the way I want to. My friend, let me tell you, you know, uh, Frank Sinatra made that song popular. I did it my way. You keep doing it your way and you're going to stand before God one day and you're going to hear the word, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I knew you not. And I grieve. My heart breaks. I have told people because I know firsthand, I'm going to tell you something. I know in my soul this morning, heaven is real. Yes. I know heaven is real. But I know the flames of hell are just as real. And I am so concerned. And I, you know, and I to have told people, you might go to hell. But you're going to go to hell fighting my prayers every step of the way. Because I'm going to pray, God, get a hold of your heart and save your soul. Yes. How are we going to stand when the heat is turned up? We're going to stand just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yes. I know my God is able. Yes. I know in whom I believe and I am persuaded that he is able to keep me. Yes. We have become so geared. We have become so geared through education. And nothing wrong with education. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But my point is, we've been so geared through education to do things our own, be independent. We don't need anyone. I can do it. I don't need any help. I can do it. My friend, let me tell you something. I can do nothing on my own. I can do nothing on my own. And if it were not for the anointing of the Holy Ghost, strengthening me right now I would not be standing before you I've been wrestling I've been tossing and turning all night and all morning but it's because of his endowment of power that I stand before you in love today and encourage you it's time to where we begin to seek a closer walk with God. It's time where we begin to seek a closer relationship with the Lord. Yes. I know that there's not a lot of teaching, there's not a lot of preaching, there's not a lot of talk today about being baptized in the Holy Spirit. But rest assured of one thing, that's fixing to change here at Cross Point. I'm not going to do it every service. I'm not going to tell you that I'm going to do it every service. But you are going to be hearing as the Holy Spirit directs my heart, teaching and preaching and instruction on things we need pertaining to the endowment of power for service. Hallelujah. This time we start praying, Lord, I need that power he's talking about. I've been struggling with some things. I've been I've been trying to, and it seems like Lord, the heart the, the harder I try, the worse it gets. Can I tell you, it's going to be that way. I remember like it was yesterday, and it was many many years ago now. <clears throat> away from God in my relationship, as backslidden as a person could get running and rebellious knowing I had people praying I mean, and the church was praying thank God for a praying church thank God for a praying parents and thank God for, for praying family and thank God for a praying church because I could feel their prayers make the hair on the back of that one stand up and I knew they were praying
And I said, well, God, if I can quit doing this thing, I'll start going to church again. God, if I can quit doing that thing, I'll start going to church again. God, if I can quit this, you can't even notice what I keep saying, I, if I can. If I, and it seemed like the harder I tried, the worse I got. I come to a place one day and I said, Lord God, I surrender to you. I can't do it. But here I am, such as I am. I'm yours. And if you'll forgive me, I'll give you my life. Do die, sink, or swim. Somewhere, somehow, I'm going to make it. With your hand. That was then and here it is today. And I stand before you in love, but I tell you this morning, with the love of the heart of a pastor that tells you, if God can do that kind of work in my life, He can do whatever kind of work in your life that you may need. But it's time where we start asking, we start praying. Well, I don't understand a whole lot about it. Well, that's okay. That'll come with that. But I want to encourage you to start praying for the power of the Holy Ghost. The unction, the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Because I'll tell you something, we have family members we need to be talking to. We have friends we need to be talking to. We have acquaintances we need to be talking to. We have a world around us we need to be trying to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with. Them. And our words alone aren't going to do it. But our words impacted by the Holy Ghost can prick the hearts of thousands. I'm saying this and I'm closing. The night that he was arrested, Peter denied the Lord three times. Afterwards, he went out, he repented. On the day of Pentecost, when he was baptized in the Holy Ghost, Peter stood with a boldness and with a tenacity that he had never known before. As he stood that day, in some of the same crowd that was there when they crucified Jesus were no doubt watching what was taking place that day. And Peter stood with a boldness they had never known before. As he began to preach, men and brethren, these are not drunk as you suppose, seeing it's just the third hour of the day, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he began to preach. And the word of God tells us that when Peter got through, people were pricked in their heart. Their hearts were touched. It wasn't because of the words that he spoke. It was because of the endowment of power of God upon the words that he spoke. That men's hearts were pricked and 3,000 people gave their heart to Jesus Christ that day. I want to encourage you. I want to exhort you. I will plead with you. I'll get on my knees if I need to to ask you. It's time where we realize we need more than what we've got. And it's time where we realize that there is the power that we need, the ability we need is available to us. All we've got to do is ask and receive. Bow your head with me. Holy Lord God of heaven, we come to you today and we're thankful for your love and grace.